We're going to try to close out the book of Ecclesiastes. If you have been following along, we have gotten up to chapter 5 and chapter 6. And of course, we are unable to deal with each verse and each section. And this will be especially true as we try to close out the book from chapter 7 through chapter 12 but we'll do the best that we can. So without further delay, I want you to notice in your Bibles, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter seven, Ecclesiastes chapter seven, and I want you to notice with me verses two through six. <clears throat> As you can see on the screen, I've given just a brief outline Chapter 7 deals with a variety of topics, but chapter 7 into chapter 8 is going to discuss the concept of wisdom. This is what is to be learned as we live here in this life. The proposition was set forth from the very beginning of this book in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 2, where Solomon declares all to be vanity. It is a chasing after the wind, that is, this life. If this life does not have God in view, and does not keep him in our focus, well then everything that we pursue indeed is vanity. As we work our way through the book, we're finding out that Solomon experienced life, and through his experiences, he's given his observations. He's giving the lessons that he's learned. And over and over, seeing that he has gone through life to fulfill the physical lusts, his desires, whatever his whim pulled him towards, it was always the same, all is vanity. Except when we come to the end of the book, where he teaches us that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments because everything will be brought under judgment. But I call your attention to that because as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 through 6, I think he hits upon something that we who are seeking to follow the will of God will encounter and begin to understand. And that is... A life of righteousness may be filled with sorrow. You know, Jesus talked about this in the book of John chapter 16. Just before his departure, he reminded his apostles as well as his disciples that we would lament and weep while the world rejoiced. But that weeping and lamenting would only be for a season. And so, here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 through 6, notice what Solomon says. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. So, as he has considered life from chapters 1 through chapter 6, we see that he has gone through various experiences. He pursued revelry. He pursued laughter. He pursued wealth and work and leadership. But at the end of it all, he still writes here in chapter 7, verse 2, that our lives are going to be full of sorrow. The righteous man who focuses upon the will of God as he views life and sees all the injustice and the oppression that goes on, as he sees that the will of God is not being carried out by the whole of man, he's going to be met with this depression. And so he says, better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. He's identifying, perhaps, someone who has passed from this life. And when we 
go and attend a celebration of life or a funeral. This is typically what occurs. We have tears of sorrow because we're going to miss that individual. We think upon the times that we once had, and now we are recalling the fact that we will no longer have those times anymore. But even though at that very moment it might not seem as if it is beneficial, Solomon is actually saying it is better to go to that house than to go to the house of feasting. Why? Because this is the end of all men. It is good from time to time that we come to terms with our mortality. It is good from time to time to realize that we don't live forever. And that being the case, we ought to embrace this sorrow and recognize the lesson to be learned from it. In verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter. For by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. So Solomon here is anticipating that some would suggest that sorrow is not something that we want to experience or engage in. In fact, we live in a generation where we are trying to eliminate as much sorrow as possible. And so we typically turn away from problems. We don't want to talk about our issues. We want things to be done in a hurry. If there is any difficulty, we want them to be resolved immediately. Because after all, sorrow has the ability to really bring us down, to hold us back. But Solomon here is identifying that it's better than laughter. You think about laughter, and I think for the most part, every commercial that you'll see that's promoting some sort of a product will give the impression of joy and laughter and happiness. Why? Because most companies want us to associate their product with a better quality of life. They don't want to associate it with a life of depression that's drab. And so everything that is being promoted or put forth in this world is going to have that quality that this is going to be fun, that this is the better life. And to some degree, we buy into it. We see that commercial. We hear those influencers on the internet. And we buy into that concept that life will be better if we had those things, if we did those things, if we pursued those goals. But Solomon writes, sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. Why do you suppose that he says, by a sad countenance, the heart is made better? Why do you suppose that's the case? As we open it up briefly for any comments. All right. Be more careful in your conduct. David? All right. But why? Why sorrow? You've identified the passages that will demonstrate that these things are good even though we live in a world where we tend to look at them as bad, but why by a sad countenance is the heart made better? You ever given some thought to that? It's because when we... All right. 
Indeed, when we overcome and get through the challenges of life, there is a grand reward that awaits us. But the here and now, a sad countenance makes the heart better because when we're met with failure, when we're met with sorrow, it forces us to take an inventory. You get what I mean by that? It requires us to stop and think, why am I feeling this way? Why am I going through this? And what that begins to do is it causes us to go through a sense of self-examination. When we pass, or rather when we attend a funeral, whether we want to wrestle with it or not, we examine the fact that we're mortal. I think that's one reason why many people don't like to attend funerals. They don't like to go to the hospital because it's a sober reminder that we are fragile and that life at any moment can just break down and ruin. And so here, as we're taking a look at this, Solomon is identifying for us, put it in the overall picture, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In the overall picture, as he comes to the realization that we cannot live a life of disobedience, that we cannot live a life of wickedness, it's going to seem as if we are withheld from the joys or the happiness or the pleasures of life. And when that occurs, there's going to be a sense of detachment, there's going to be a sense of depression, and if we're not viewing life correctly, we may allow that sorrow to work on us and that curiosity ultimately to destroy us. And so Solomon says, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. It's at these times of failure, it's at these times of sorrow that we begin to examine ourselves and begin to ask the questions, why? What can I do to get myself out of this? And so in verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You see, when we find ourselves in wealth, in great benefits and pleasures, we grow distracted. Notice what the book of Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, what he writes in verses 7 through 9, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, two things I request of you, Deprive me not before I die. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. The kind of life that the Proverbs author is describing here is one where he is going to survive by the things which are convenient for him. He's not going to have little, and he's not going to have much. He's going to have just enough. And so he says, remove falsehood and lies far from me. I don't want that kind of life where I'm in dishonesty. Give me neither poverty nor riches. I don't want that kind of life where I'm struggling or I've completely forgotten about you. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? He's identifying that a person who's well-to-do, who has the pleasures of this life, they're typically the ones who are distracted from righteousness or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of my God or if we are brought severely low and we never understand the purpose of our suffering or our sorrow 
and we completely leave the faith of God. Notice again in the book of Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, as Jesus is describing the parable of the seed and the sower, in verse 14, Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So going back to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. But isn't that exactly what this generation and what most generations of the past have been pushing and promoting? That's the kind of life that we want. Perhaps it became more prevalent back in the early 90s. I think the show was maybe in the 80s, I'm not sure. But the lifestyle of the rich and famous, remember that? What was the whole purpose behind that? It was to cause those who did not have to want, to demonstrate this is what life should be like. This is the kind of house that you should have. These are the kind of cars that you should drive. These are the kind of clothes that you should wear. These are the kind of vacations that you should take. And I think ever since then, we've had an entire generation of individuals who have been in search of that idea. They think that that's the American dream. And so coming back to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Because it's precisely at that moment that we are reminded that our life is brief. We exist for but a brief moment. And so therefore we should say, if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than a man to hear the song of fools. That's something that you don't see these days. In fact, these, what are they, Gen Zers? Nowadays, it used to be millennials and Gen Zers, and you have them in the workplace, and they can't be told anything. Because as they receive correction, this is what the uh, Fortune 500 companies would suggest. This is what concepts of leadership would suggest, that a newer generation not being able to receive this correction ends up just throwing it all away. You know what, I quit. If I can't have it my way, then I don't want to do it anyone's way. But according to this passage, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. That's one thing that perhaps past generations gleaned as they saw their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents suffer through depression economically. And over the years, building back, having that kind of national spirit, these Individuals grew up in these times, recognized the benefit of learning from the failures of others, hearing the correction of others, how not to do it so that you can prevent yourself from going back into this place. But now that we have lived a life of great success in the United States of America, we've come to a position of entitlement. And so according to this passage, our generation sometimes finds it difficult to hear any correction, which is why sometimes we're met with great difficulty when evangelizing. Who wants to hear that their life is not being lived properly? Who wants to hear that they have to repent? And all of that that comes with the concept of repentance, hell and fire, doing wrong, immorality, 
This is the reason why this word repentance is not a popular word these days because it's a loaded term that carries with it these associations that sometimes people just don't like to discuss or entertain in their thinking. And so we who are wise, we figure out a way to address these issues without touching upon those words. But here, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than a man than for a man to hear the song of fools. But that's exactly what we want to do. We don't want to hear people yapping in our ear about life. We just want to turn up the radio and listen to the lyrics of the song that's playing. And 9.9 .9 times out of 10, that song is telling us, live your life, you only live once. Enjoy your life as you think you should enjoy it. And Solomon here is trying to help us understand that the life of righteousness, this is what we're going to be met with, and we shouldn't think as if it's something unusual or something strange that we're wrestling with whenever we're met with this rejection and now we're finding ourselves in this state of depression because it's better to be in this mourning and in this sorrow. Verse six, for the crackling of thorns under a pot so is the laughter of the fool, this also is vanity. The crackling of thorns historically would be the burning of different branches that will give a light and a sound immediately at once, but then will quickly disintegrate. And so likewise with the song of the fools, the crackling of thorns, the laughter of the fool, this also is vanity. I wanted to talk to you about this point and put it in perspective because Solomon, as he goes throughout this entire book of Ecclesiastes, he is promoting this idea, all is vanity. It comes across somewhat depressing, as if he is mourning life. But... In the middle of this book, here he is reminding us that it is better to have that type of perception than to always want to be in a state of mirth or laughter or happiness. Any concluding thoughts or ideas on this section? So dropping down now to chapter 7, verses 23 and following, 23 to 29, the end of the chapter. He goes through various subjects here in chapter 7. I encourage you to read chapter 7. Chapter 7 has a lot of life-changing wisdom. If you would stop and consider its words and think about the circumstances of your own life, chapter 7 will speak to you. But as he comes to the end of this chapter in verses 23 to 29, he's wanting you to understand how he came to this conclusion. In verse 23, all this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? I applied my heart to know, to search, and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. We'll stop right there for just a moment. So what Solomon is saying here is that these observations just didn't come on the whim. He's not this guy who experienced life in a bubble or in a corner to the neglect of other people's experiences. You know, some people will try a certain product and they'll say, well, I didn't like it. Maybe it wasn't the best product or the, bre the best uh, producement of that product. Maybe they tried a restaurant. It wasn't the best server. It wasn't the best day for the chef. And so in their one experience, they might give this bad review and completely write it off. Well, we might think that this is what Solomon is doing. He experienced life in this one idea or this one mindset, and he completely wrote it off. No, 
He's saying here in verse 23, I prove by wisdom everything that we're talking about. I applied my heart to know, to search, and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. Drop down to verse 27. Here's what I found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason. In other words, he's teaching us that he went through life inductively. Inductive is a word that's typically used in logic, and it simply means that we're going to identify every particular issue, every particular point, and we're going to go down the line point for point for point, and at the end, we're going to make a proper consideration. Induction indeed is good, it is biblical, but there's also room for deduction, taking this information and then coming to a grand conclusion. And so the point is this, here's what I found, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. Even though he felt like he was getting closer to his conclusion and the answer, this was his ultimate concept, verse 29. Truly, this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. That was his conclusion. His conclusion was, we're good. As a human race, we've been created with integrity. We've been created with morality. Upright should give the image not that we are morally crooked or bent, but rather that we are morally straight, upright. God has made man upright, but they, that is man, they have gone after evil schemes, evil plotting, which has brought them low to this disaster of life. Now, what caused this? in Solomon's conclusion. Go back up to verse 23 as he's talking about this. And I wanted to deal with this, ladies, because this is one of those passages where sometimes ladies might feel as if they don't get a proper uh, explanation. He says in verse 26, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. Why do you suppose he's talking about this in the middle of his explanation for the conclusion that he's reached? I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. Handcuffs. You know, sometimes men often refer to their wives. It used to be the case, this was a, a comical statement, the old ball and chain. <laughs> Here the concept of her hands being fetters. The woman's heart is snares and nets, full of emotional traps or emotional blackmailing. And you can see this in a variety of circumstances in the Old Testament. Whenever Samson had taken for himself a wife and he would not tell her the riddle, how did she emotionally manipulate him? Well, you don't love me. That's the reason why you're not telling me. If you truly loved me, you will do this for me. But why is Solomon talking about this? Drop down to verse 28, which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. What's going on here? <laughs> yes.
but he allowed himself to fall in this crazy. Does everybody understand what Myron just explained? <laughs> First Kings chapter 11, verse 3, tells us how many wives Solomon had and how many concubines he had. And guess what? They total a thousand. And the wives and the women that he allowed himself to be captured by emotionally were the type of individuals that Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 6 and 7 warned about the evil woman, the woman who is loud, the woman who is manipulative and seductive, and use, utilizing her beauty not for righteousness but for unrighteousness. And so what we do find here in chapter 7, Solomon is trying to figure out, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I get here in this life with all the problems that I'm having? And as Myron pointed out, well, it was the companions you chose. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 32 and 33 will teach us be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good morals. Don't allow ourselves to be deceived, but they're so handsome, but they're so pretty. So were the daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6, and look what happened to the sons of God who took them for wives. Eventually, it destroyed the entirety of society. It was the same thing that God explained in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Don't take for yourselves wives from the Canaanites. Was God being racist? No. He was simply withholding them from their frame of thought, their worldview, their pagan concepts, which he knew would pull them away from righteousness. And so as Solomon here is considering how he got to this place in life, that's the reason why he's discussing these women. But this is not to say that women in general are no good. Briefly, we have several women throughout the Bible who are uplifted and magnified for their great deeds, like Hannah, who brought forth Samuel, not to mention Mary, who was chosen to give birth to Jesus, and a variety of other women that the Bible makes reference to, Proverbs chapter 31 even signifies the possibility of there being a virtuous woman whose price is far above rubies. So Sovereign here is not being male chauvinistic. He's simply identifying for his readers how he got to this place he was adding one thing to, to another, and he was wallowing in his sorrow, but he was also understanding that there's lessons to be learned. And then the grand idea, God made us all good. We're not sinners by nature. We've chosen to go after sin. I think there was two hands, Ed and then uh, Greg. Mm -hmm. If he had and committed all the sin, he wouldn't be here. He's just suffering the consequences of sin. Correct. The sinner shall be trapped by her. Very good. Greg? Say that again. He's not in the hall of fame today. Because of that, but he's, he, he answers his own questions. I mean, chapter 9 and verse 9. So very good. 
actually going to reach that if we have the time for that. I don't know if we're going to. Um, but again, closing out chapter 7, he is demonstrating to his readers that this is not something of a disgruntled human being, and this is his take on all of life, but rather this is an individual who pursued life through wisdom, and he considered everything that was going on, and his conclusion was that God has made us good. So this brings us to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1 is too good to miss, so I want to call your attention to that. Who is like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face is changed. What's going on here? Chapter 8, he is demonstrating the transformation that occurs when we allow the wisdom of our experiences to work on us. When we allow the wisdom of God's word to work on us. The transformation that occurs, a man's wisdom makes his face shine. When we are in sorrow, it does not shine. It's puffing. Our eyes are darkened. Our heads are bowed low. Our skin does not radiate. But whenever we are in a sense of joy, our eyes are wide open. Our, our conversation is more vocal. Our heads are lifted up. A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. Here, it's going to make reference to the facial expressions that would typically be held by someone who is in much sorrow. There's a frown. There's a crinkling in the forehead, not only by the one in sorrow, but also by the one who is just in a hard life of disobedience. There is no joy in their eyes. But wisdom changes that. A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. And so Solomon here begins to demonstrate that through wisdom, he began to change his outlook. He began to change his character and his personality. And he did not allow these things in life to bring him down and to bring him to disaster. So in verses 10 through 13, this is what he says. Then I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness and they were forgotten in the city where they had done, where they had so done. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. It's an interesting passage here. I typically use this verse when talking about child development or moral development. Because the point that is made in the book of Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15 and Proverbs 29 and verse 15 is that children who are disobedient must be disciplined. There is a proper discipline that must occur. 29.15 and Proverbs says, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Well, what's the concept behind that? Verse 11 says, if the heart, or rather, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, discipline is not carried out in a proper fashion and in a timely fashion, the heart is fully set to do evil. The individual learns that there are no consequences, and due to that fact, they begin to puff themselves up and harden themselves against correction. But the younger you are and you understand that there are consequences to actions, then the better you will be in life as you go on living, recognizing that you can't just do anything that you want. But Solomon here is identifying what is the source of a lot of evil that's in the world. Improper parenting, 
But verse 12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. Was that the final bell, or is that the... That was the second bell already? <laughs> well, the conclusion is, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Appreciate your time and your attention. We'll be dismissed until the worship service.